Okay, so we're here on uh, Blake Street in downtown Denver. Uh, as I was looking for places to do field work here in, in the Colorado area, um, I had a friend alert me to the fact that actually Palantir had relocated its headquarters uh, from the Bay Area here to Denver. And the, it's the building behind us. The, the address given on their website says Suite 250. So it's sort of low key um, given the scope of Palantir in, in larger um, government accounting and geopolitical frameworks because I feel like they're going to play a significant role in sort of the ubiquitous uh, surveillance, tracking, social impact space. Um, but yeah, again, it's very low key. And I was mentioning to, to Jason as we walked up, I'm like, it's kind of a small building. And he made the point that really, you know, discreet is probably what they're going for at this point. And like the future of work is that you're working from your sofa or your kitchen table, not actually in a physical office. So, um, you know, a, a huge organization like this could occupy a rather small footprint um, downtown rather than necessarily a, a big office complex sort of in the suburbs part of the city. So I thought that was an interesting observation. And uh, the, our next stop is going to be at the Capitol. And we're going to talk a lot about the state of Colorado and um, digital citizenship, digital government, and as it links to pay for success finance. But here for Palantir, I wanted to raise um, the issue that early on in my research around education, Santa Clara County, California, which is in um, the Silicon Valley area, was the test bed for um, a number of pay for success finance, uh, social impact bond deals. Um, it was sort of a mixed bag. Some were strictly pay for success, some were formal social impact bonds. Uh, they included an early childhood social impact bond, uh, an early literacy social um, pay for success deal, and then also two social impact bonds, one for homelessness and one for mental health. Now, the, those latter two, the homelessness social impact bond, which was called uh, Welcome Home, and the uh, mental health one, which was called Partners in Wellness, uh, it, within the pay for success finance space, you always have a third party that does the deal evaluation. So you, you have an arrangement between investors, uh, the public agencies, and then there are supposed to be certain target metrics hit in order to fulfill the, the terms of the deal. And so in the case of both of those two, the homelessness and the mental health social impact bonds, Palantir was actually the third party reviewing. And if you understand uh, Palantir's connections with uh, State Intelligence, Defense Department, Homeland Security. Um, one of their uh, early funders was InQtel, which is the venture capital arm of the CIA. You can imagine how you have these vulnerable communities that need social supports, and then all of a sudden they become sort of sucked into this data vortex where um, their lives and behaviors become enmeshed in finance deals that are overseen, um, you know, by an entity that has um, very diverse interests, and many of them that you know, maybe at odds of just the general dispossessed poor person that needs the services. So, you know, I wanted to bring that up. Um, the other element, so Palantir does some of their work as pro bono. Uh, they have an uh, philanthropy division and they call it philanthropy engineering, right? And so, again, we're looking at uh, sort of social progressivism, this continuation from you know the er late 19th, earliest 20th century of engineered society to certain specifications. But right now, the specifications that society is going to be engineered to will be in alignment with investors, right? Um, the Black Rocks of the world, the vanguards of the world, the state street capital. Um, society will be reshaped to meet the needs of global capital. And Palantir is playing a role um, both in facilitating the assessment of the deals, but then also in implementing a larger state surveillance <laughs> component um, that was going to be linked to your digital identity. Uh, so I want to mention, so Peter, uh, and I'm not sure if it's Thiel or Thiel, um, I'm not sure the correct pronunciation, T-H-I-E-L, uh, he was the founder of Pay uh, PayPal. And so a lot of what's going to be advancing moving forward is that my, assess my sense is that the pay for success deals will be linked in with conditional cash transfers. Um, it might take the form of like a universal basic income or a cash payment system. But those payment systems, it's very obvious now that they're going to be digital. It's not going to be bills in your wallet. It's going to be digital credit on a phone or other smart device or potentially in some future, some sensor that's in your hand, you know, or, you know, biometric tattoo or something. And then you, the, the money in those, those systems can be programmed. Uh, and programmed and linked to smart contracts to be used only for certain functions. Like, here's your public benefit, but you can use X amount for 
uh, rent, you can use X amount for food, you can use X amount for reskilling, um, you can use X amount for mental health services, and you will have very little autonomy in that equation, though there will likely be some because these betting markets are going to be betting on your behavioral compliance. So the money that comes will be sort of monopoly money, and then um, uh, that's sort of the starter money for the game, the game of life. I will mention those social impact bonds that were happening at, uh, in Santa Clara County, uh, Partners in Wellness and Welcome Home, also had ties to um, the University of California, San Francisco medical complex. And so, you know, we talked in Salt Lake City about the interface between uh, predictive profiling of mental illness, of how that relates to social impact finance, um, social uh, illness and addiction, uh, how it how it meshes with the finance deals and how it will mesh with wearable technology and potentially um, remote sensing technology, right? Because what they were doing at the Huntsman Center was they were planning to use these MRIs to sort of tease apart the neurons to identify whether you were prone to depression or schizophrenia or addiction. They were looking to, to get very nuanced data um, to really to fund these deals tied to mental health. Um, so in my mind, that's a problem when what we're doing is we're playing a giant game. Um, now I will say uh, the year or so before the lockdown started, uh, one of the first uh, deployments of digital identity in this country happened in Austin and it was part of the ID 2020 program. You know, everyone has a good digital identity, good ID that's backed by uh, Pierre Omidyar. Uh, that program uh, was called My Pass in Austin. It was funded by the Robert Woods Johnson Foundation and Bloomberg Philanthropies. Um, Bloomberg is also active in the pay for success finance space here in Denver. And so what they did was they put unhoused people on blockchain uh, for their medical records. And in that case, it was not high tech. It was simply that each person had their biometrics taken and they were assigned like a laminated card QR code that would, would represent them digitally as a citizen. So it doesn't have to be something as fancy as like they're going to put a chip in your hand. It could really be something as simple as a laminated QR code, which now like we've all started to become accustomed to that that's where things are moving. Um, so I think we need to consider that in light of pay for success finance deals, the kind that Palantir was involved with. And here in Denver, they actually have a pay for success deal for the homeless, and it's connected to both housing first services and something called assertive community treatment. And I'm not totally familiar with that, but that's an interesting name, assertive, assertive community treatment. Um, that was, uh, there was an article on this in the Urban Institute's website, and partners included the Denver Foundation, uh, the. Python uh, Foundation, now Gary Investments, the Walton Family Foundation, uh, John and Laurel Arnold uh, Foundation. Now again, John Arnold was Enron, Energy's Futures Trading, and he actually got caught in Baltimore doing sort of illicit deals with the city council to do um, surveillance flights of the city tied to um, predictions around crime. So that's part of that. Um, Living Cities, that's a Rockefeller program tied to smart city development. Uh, the Nonprofit Finance Fund, which was very central in all of the Santa Clara deals with George Overholzer. Uh, Colorado Health and Northern Trust. So there's multiple partners in that. Harvard Kennedy School was providing technical support as well as Colorado Access, which I understand is uh, Colorado's sort of Medicaid health system. Um, and uh, services were provided by Corporation for Supportive Housing and Enterprise Community Partners. And the payer on that deal was the city and county of Denver. It was about a five-year program that was starting in 2016. So again, Housing First is a model where you um, people who are in crisis, you get them in housing, um, and then you try to take care of their needs, which on the surface, I don't have a problem with, but if what we're building is potentially um, smart housing with sensors, with conditional money, um, with uh, non-consensual um, services provided to people, um, where there's surveillance involved and where those people then become commodities in global markets, that becomes a problem. I think that ethically, that's a huge problem. Um, then what we have is poverty and uh, trauma that creates money for the wealthiest people in the world. And that's not going to fix the problems. If you have profitable poverty management, you're simply going to grow more poverty. So, you know, Palantir's role in all of this, if they continue uh, with what they had done in Santa Clara County, will be to assess those deals and possibly provide impact data, I'm assuming, uh, to fulfill them. Now, a few, um, 
earlier, maybe like three years ago, uh, there was a program that set up opportunity zones and every governor was supposed to identify 20% of its uh, low income uh, census tracts to be identified for uh, these opportunity zone areas. And they were for redevelopment. Essentially, it was a way for global financial interests to come in and gentrify huge swaths of land, uh, make investments in both real estate and businesses, and these could include uh, serv NGO service providers like charter schools, maybe like uh, wellness providers, uh, counseling, uh, various companies, and if they could hold their uh, investment for up to t for 10 years, they would never pay uh, capital gains tax on their original investment which is a huge windfall. And these are like portfolios. It's really only these really big companies that have the resources to like sit on their investment for 10 years, but they totally can do that. So they can come in, remake whole, whole neighborhoods. There are no protections from gentrification for the local people. And this is very much connected with uh, the Federal Reserve's redevelopment programs, both community development uh, of uh, infrastructure and human resource development tied to reskilling. So in 2019 in Philadelphia, our Federal, uh, Federal Reserve Office, uh, led by uh, Patrick Harker, uh, with, with our former mayor, Michael Nutter, who's a Bloomberg What Works government guy, they came together with this Pathways to Prosperity program. I'm wait until it goes. Okay, so this, there is this Pathways to Prosperity program, which was essentially reskilling workers into things like commercial laundries, or they were paired, partnered with Comcast, which is the telecom provider, because someone has to do the wiring for the metaverse and the surveillance state. And so they were reskilling. Now, this was pre pre lockdowns, right? Pre, you know, many, many people of the middle class losing their jobs in the lower class and then having to reskill for the fourth industrial revolution. So the central banks. Um, interconnected with the opportunity zones are really, really central. Um, and, and probably a lot of this redevelopment is going to be linked to smart um, smart systems, a smart infrastructure. They will, they will come into low-income communities, probably like level it out, and then just start from scratch and rebuild what essentially might sort of be like friendly gulags, right, of social impact support systems. And um, so it's interesting here in Denver, there's an, an area that's sponsored by Panasonic. It's out near the airport. It's on the border of a, sort of a large opportunity zone on the east side of the city. And um, this, this Pena Center is, is on a transit hub. They're uh, piloting autonomous vehicles, piloting smart pavement, uh, piloting smart street lights that they've said will advertise to you based on your personal profile. And uh, Panasonic did a previous city outside of Tokyo. So you can imagine that these opportunity zones would be remade specifically with um, you know, supportive housing or mental health or services involved, but you know, it's going to be conditional. It's going to be conditional on your behavioral compliance and it's going to be tied in with um, you know, programmed money and, and you know, your QR codes, which we'll talk about later, but you know, your, your digital identity and, and Colorado is, is coming up with its own, you know, your identity on a smartphone um, with you, you having to show proof of things like um, you know, your house status in order to access parts of society. And I can imagine there, these zones, these opportunity zones will be test beds. Uh, the homeless, people who have mental illness will be early pilots for this. This will be profitable and um, you know, they will work out the kinks for the larger program and you know, that they will then apply to smart cities, charter cities, special economic zones. Essentially with geofencing, you can just, it's the wild west. You know, you can just carve out parts of a city and companies can take it over and do whatever they want in there. And that's, that's where we're at. So anyway, new, new headquarters of, new low key headquarters of Palantir behind me in downtown Denver.